الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على الرسول الكريم وبعد الحمد لله we have returned to our class uh, in the tafsir uh, زاد مصير في علم التفسير by Imam عبد الرحمن بن الجوزي رحمه الله whose laqab is uh, Jamal al-Din we are uh, nearing the end of the 24th juzza. We'll be starting the 25th juzza today. We are in Surah Fussilat. And Surah Fussilat is the 41st surah. And we're looking to make some headway into Surah Shura, the 42nd surah. And so we're moving from Ayah 39 onwards today. So the Imam, rahimahullah, he starts by saying, quote, And so, the Exalted One has discussed the case regarding those who reject faith when he has told us وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنَّكَ تَرَى الْأَرْضَ خَاشِعَةً فَإِذَا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءِ فَإِذَا أَنْزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءِ أَهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ إِنَّ الَّذِي أَحْيَاهَا لَمُحْيِي الْمَوْتَى إِنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي آيَاتِنَا لَا يَخْفَوْنَ عَلَيْهَا أَفَمَنْ يُلْقَى فِي النَّارِ خَيْرٌ فِي النَّارِ خَيْرٌ أَمَّنْ يَأْتِي آمِنًا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ اعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ إِنَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ إن الذين كفروا بالذكر لما جاءهم وإنه لك لكتاب عزيز لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه تنزيل من حكيم حميد ما يقال لك إلا ما قد قيل للرسل من قبلك إن ربك لذو مغفرة وذو عقاب أليم ولو ولو جعلناه قرانا اعجميا لقالوا لولا فصلت اياته اعجمي وعربي قل هو للذين امنوا هدى وشفاء والذين لا يؤمنون في آذانهم وقروا وهو عليهم عما أولئك ينادون من مكان بعيد ولقد آتينا موسى الكتاب فاختلف فيه ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك لقضي بينهم وإنهم لفي شك منه مريب لفي شك منه مريب 
من عمل صالحا فلنفسه ومن أساء فعليها وما ربك بظلام للعبيد And from his signs is that you see the earth desolate and when we send down when we send down upon it the water it overgrows and increases and that which is given life is given life by the one who gives life to the dead and indeed he has power over everything indeed those who deny the signs they are not hidden from us is it the case then that the one who is thrown in the fire is better? Or is it the one that comes believing on the day of resurrection? Act according to what you will. Indeed, he Allah sees that which you do. Those who reject the remembrance when it came to them. Indeed, this has been recorded and it is for a mighty book indeed. No falsehood comes in front of it nor behind it. It is revelation from the all-wise, the worthy of praise. Whatever has been said to you, nothing has been said except that which has been said to messengers from before you that were denied. Indeed, your Lord is the possessor of forgiveness and also the possessor of the stern retribution and punishment. If we had made the Quran to be in a foreign language, they would have said, why are its ayat not clearly explained? This is in a foreign language, yet its bearer is an Arab. Say, it is for those who believe as a guidance and a pure and a purity and a healing for the hearts. Those who do not believe have in their ears a blockage and they are blinded. These same ones shall be called on that day from a place far. We already before had given Musa the book, and it was different in. If it had not been for words sent forth from your Lord, the judgment would have been made between them. And they are in a state of doubt regarding the matter. Whoever does a righteous deed, it's for himself. And whoever should lead a sinful way, then that is against his own self. Your Lord is not an oppressor towards his slaves. Surah Fussilat, the 41st Surah, Ayat 39 to 46. And when the Exalted One mentions regarding his signs, from his signs is that you see the earth desolate. Qatada has said that desolate here is talking about the fact that it is desolate of vegetation and life. It's dry. Al-Azhadi has said, when the earth is dry and it hasn't been rained on, it is classified as being desolate. Then it sent, has sent down water upon it in which there is an increase. That increase means the growth of vegetation. And when the vegetation increases, the earth then becomes fertile or fecund. Now we've already explained some of this in Surah Al-Hajj, the 22nd Surah, Ayah 5. Those who deny the signs, Muqatil ibn Suleiman has said, those who deny the signs is referring to Abu Jahl. Now, as for the definition of the word ilhad in terms of denial, this has been mentioned in Surah Al-Nahl, the 16th Surah, Ayah 103. Now, the intent of denial here in, these, in, in, these, in this ayah is referring to five things the unbelievers do to the signs of Allah. The five things that unbelievers do to the signs of Allah starts with number one. Number one is 
putting the speech given in other than its context putting the speech given in other than its context this was mentioned by Ibn Abbas or the yellow wine Number two is whistling and clapping when the Qur'an is being recited. Whistling and clapping when the Qur'an is being recited. This was mentioned by Mujahid. Number three is denying the signs by speaking against them. Denying the signs while speaking against them. This was said by Qatada. Number four, number four is refusing to accept the signs and also preventing others from doing so. Refusing to accept the signs and also preventing others from doing so. This was mentioned by Asudei. Number five is pushing people away from believing in the signs. Pushing people away from believing in the signs. This was mentioned by Muqatil ibn Suleiman. And when the Exalted One says, that what they do is not hidden, what they conceal is not hidden from us, this is a veiled threat that he, exalted be he, gave against the unbelievers of their being reckoned. And when he says, is it then the one who is rolled over in the fire on his face better, or the one who comes believing on the day of resurrection? This ayah is general for all believers and unbelievers. Although it has been said 
that the two that the comparisons being made between believer and unbeliever have been compared between Abu Jahl and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq as mentioned by Ibn Abbas this ayah has been used to compare between Abu Jahl and Ammar ibn Yasir as said by Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl it has been said to be a comparison between Abu Jahl and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as said by Ibn al-Sa'ib and Muqatil it's been used as a comparison between Abu Jahl and Uthman ibn Affan as mentioned by Atha'alabi it's been mentioned as a comparison between Abu Jahl and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib as discussed by Al-Wahidi it's been a comparison made between Abu Jahl and Umar ibn Al-Khattab and Al-Mawirdi mentions this one and also the comparison between any believer and unbeliever because the comparison is being made between both of them the one who is turned over on his face versus the one who comes believing and safe on the day of resurrection. When the exalted one says, those who reject the dhikr, the remembrance, is referring to the Qur'an. Because Allah has referred to the Qur'an as a dhikr. So, the dhikr, they abandon the dhikr. So when it comes to them, they reject it. And they shall be brought to account. And judged for denying the revelation. وَإِنَّهُ لَكِتَابٌ عَزِيز And that he is strong against the book that has been brought this mighty book he is strong against it meaning that shaitan is strong against anyone who might come towards the revelation because he does not want them to find the path he is strong in the sense of strong against that which Allah has revealed Whereas towards falsehood, he is opened up, as said by Muqatya and Ibn Sa'id. And he does not want this to occur, that people be guided. This mighty book is one in which the people have been stopped from being able to bring the likeness of it. And when he says no falsehood can approach it or come from behind it, it means that it's not harmed by the deniers, as said by Sa'id ibn Jubayr. No falsehood can come from behind it. And that falsehood be from, could be from shaitan. And by no falsehood coming behind it, it also refers to the fact that it cannot be changed. This was said by Mujahid. Qatada has said that shaitan can't decrease from it at all from its truth. Nor can he add to it any falsehood. Mujahid has said, Nothing enters into the Qur'an that's not from it. From in front or back of it, meaning at the time of its revelation or after its revelation. There's no book before that can nullify it. Nor is there any book after that can nullify it. No falsehood comes in what's been given as its information regarding previous nations from before, nor what is to come after. And no messenger was denied before except that the people said the same thing to the messengers before you. So the people said to 
messengers before you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, magician, sorcerer, madman, and they reject it, just like you're being rejected. And this has been the commentary given by Al Hasan Al Qatad and the vast majority. And that whatever you've informed them of is that which the prophets from before you've informed them of. That Allah is forgiving and that he's also the possessor of wrath for those that reject faith. As mentioned by Al-Mawurdi. And if we made it, meaning the book that was sent down upon him, a Quran in other than the language of the Arabs, they would have said, why are its ayat not clear? Meaning... Why are its ayat not made clear in Arabic so that we can understand it? Because he's saying the book came to us. Is it then in a language that is not Arabic, but an Arab is bearing it? Now, this ayah, A'ajamiyun wa Arabiyun, Ibn Kathir, Nafi'a, Abu Amr ibn Umar, and Hafs ibn Asim. And Hafs from Asim say, Ajami. Whereas Hamza al Kasai, Abu Bakr from Asim, recited as Ajami, with two Hamzas. So, what this is referring to is is this a book that's come in a non Arabic language? But the person coming with it is an Arab? How can that be? So this question being asked is not one for clarification, but it's one of rebuke, because how could the people have accepted this in other than that language? In fact, if it had come in other than their language, they would have been even more firm in rejection. Qul huwa, say it, meaning the Qur'an. It, meaning the Qur'an, is for those who believe as a guidance from error and a healing for the doubts and they and the spiritual starvation that is in themselves. As for those that reject faith, they have a waqar, which means deafness. Because they're not accepting they have abandoned the acceptance. And so deafness has crept into the years. And blindness has been put upon them. So Qatada has said, they are deaf to the Quran and they are also blind to it. And they shall be called from a far off place. Meaning that they shall not hear nor understand like the one who's called from far away. So they cannot understand or hear the revelation. And we gave the book to Musa. We gave, our, we gave the book to Musa. Now this is a comparison being given between Nabi Musa alayhi salam and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning, just as he believed, just as a people believed in your book, and some people denied, the same thing happened with the book of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Had it not been for a word sent ahead from us, meaning, had the punishment not been set aside, for a specified time on the day of resurrection, then the punishment would have completely overwhelmed the rejectors all of a sudden. Yet they are in doubt regarding you being truthful in what you say and your book. And they are filled with doubt and suspicion. The Exalted One starts the 25th Juz and he says, إِلَيْهِ يُرَدُّ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ وَمَا تَخْرُجُ مِنْ ثَمَرَاتٍ مِنْ أَكْمَامِهَا وَمَا تَحْمِلُ 
وَمَا تَحْمِلُ مِنْ أُنْثَى وَلَا تَضَعُ إِلَّا بِعِلْمِهِ وَيَوْمَ يُنَادِيهِمْ أَيْنَ شُرَكَاءِ قَالُوا آذَنَّاكَ مَا مِنَّا مِنْ شَهِيدٍ وَضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَدَعُونَ مِنْ قَبَلُ وَظَنُّوا مَا لَهُمْ مِنْ مَحِيصٍ لَا يَسْأَمُ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ دُعَاءِ الْخَيْرِ وَإِنْ مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ وَإِنْ مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَيَأُوسُ قَنُوطٌ وَلَئِنْ أَذَقْنَاهُ رَحْمَةً مِنَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ ضَرَّاءٍ من بعد ضراء مسته ليقولن هذا لي وما أظن الساعة وما أظن الساعة قائمة ولئن رجع إلى رب إن لي عنده للحسنى فلننبي أن الذين كفروا بما عملوا ولنذو و ولنذيقنهم من عذاب غليظ وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنْسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَأَى بِجَانِبِهِ وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ وَإِذَا مَسَّهُ الشَّرُّ فَذُو دُعَاءٍ عَرِيضٍ قل أرأيتم إن كان من عند الله ثم كفرتم به من أضل ممن هو ممن هو في شقاق بعيد سنريهم آياتنا في الآفاء في الآفاق وفي أنفسهم وفي أنفسهم حتى يتبين لهم أنه الحق أولم يكف بربك أنه على كل شيء شهيد ألا إنهم في مرية ملقاء ربهم ألا إنه بكل شيء محيط To him shall return the knowledge of the hour and whatever leaves from the herbage or fruits of the earth, from its bulbs and such like. Whatever is born and carried from the female is not set down except by his knowledge. And on the day in which they shall be called with a clear calling, where are my partners that were ascribed to me? They shall say, there is no witness that can be given that any such thing happened from us. They shall be led astray on account of that which they used to call on from before. And they think that they were guided and had some help. The human being is not stricken with anything except that he calls on goodness. And whenever evil should touch him, then he abandons his call 
is filled with remorse and doubts. If we should cause him to taste mercy from ourselves from after that difficulty, then it comes to touch him so that it might be say, ah, this is for me. And when he says this is for me, then he also concludes, I do not believe the hour will ever be established. And if I am ever returned to my Lord on that day, then I believe that I shall have in his sight a handsome reward for me. So then we shall surely inform those who rejected faith of that which they did, and we shall cause them to taste of the punishment that is firm indeed. And when we've given favor to the human being, he turns away, and turns away in haste and goes away on his side. And when there touches him some evil, then he calls out with much longing and anger. Say, don't you see if the if indeed it's in the sight of a law, then you reject it. Who is more astray than the one who was in rejection and far from the path? We shall certainly show them our signs on the horizons and in their own selves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Is it, is it not then sufficient of your Lord that he is witness over everything? Is it then that they are in doubt regarding the meeting with their Lord? Is it indeed that they don't understand that he surrounds all things? Surah Ful Silat, the 41st Surah, Ayat 47 to 54. When the Exalted One has mentioned regarding this, that the knowledge of the hour returns to him, this was sent down because of the fact that some of the Jews said to the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inform us regarding the hour, if you are a messenger, just as you claim. This was mentioned by Muqatim. The meaning of the ayah is that no one knows the time when the hour will be established, except for he, Allah. So when he's asked about it, the knowledge of the hour is returned to Allah. Now, the expression in this ayah, وَمَا تَخْرُجُ مِنْ ثَمَرَاتٍ مِنْ أَكْمَامِهَا is recited according to Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Hamza, and Al-Kasai, and Abu Bakr from Asim as, وَمَا تَخْرُجُ مِنْ ثَمَرَاتٍ in which thamarat is in the singular form. Whereas Nafi' Ibn Amr, and Hafs from Asim say, which is in the plural where it comes from its bulbs or its places in which it's covered said by Qutayba and further to this every tree that gives forward its vegetation or every tree that gives forward some type of fruit there bursts forth from it that fruit or there bursts forth from it shoots that come out of buds or in the case of the date palm tree the sweet portions of it become apparent once it ripens. So he Allah is saying that he's the one that causes this to occur. On a day in which he, Allah, shall call them, meaning to call the idol worshippers, where are my partners, those who you claim that are for me? And that is when they shall deny knowledge of it. Because the idol worshippers will be terrified. It means that we have no witness that you have a partner. So they will declare themselves free on that day from that which they used to say in the earthly life. As said by Muqatim. And that it's only the statement of the false gods which used to be worshipped. So there's no witness to them of that which they said, they think. But their false gods shall belie them in the hereafter. 
and that which they used to call on, that which they used to worship in the earthly life, that they were certain that they had some protection for. We've already mentioned some of this in Surah An-Nisa, the fourth Surah 121. So, لا يسأم الإنسان This ayah is referring to an unbeliever. So, no unbeliever is pulled away from supplication or calling out, meaning calling for good. It is his wealth and his pardon. But when some difficulty touches him, meaning poverty or, tri- or trial. So when he does so, then people in this case give up their faith. Or they despair of the mercy of Allah. And they say, there's no mercy to come to me. If they should taste some good or some pardon or some wealth, then they say, well, this is on account of my own action. I'm the only one that's deserving of this. But in the same breath, they re- they deny the resurrection and doubt it when they've been given goodness. And they say, I don't think the hour shall ever be established. Meaning, I don't really believe in any day of resurrection. And if I should be returned to my Lord, I think that I would be given a goodly reward for my effort. Meaning the paradise. Meaning just as he gave me in the earthly life goodness, I'll probably be given in the hereafter goodness just because of what I did. Close quote. Now very quickly, this is the, this is the doctrine of relativism. So because I've been a good boy and because I've had good in this life, that means that must be what's coming to me in the hereafter because it's the association of deeds with something that you're giving a law. Some, sometimes slaves of a law think that uh, both unbeliever and believer, that the relationship with a law is sort of dictated by a give and get relationship. So I do the good deeds and then I sort of hand them over to a law, like how the grocery grocery clerk at the store hands your bags over to you. You give the money, they give you the receipt, and then that's it. And so some people think of it in the Akhir as the same way. I give Allah the deeds, he gives me the keys to the paradise, and I stride right in. And that's what people think. So they're banking on being that 51% good Muslim. But here what the Imam is bringing, bringing our attention to is that the people that think this, that, well, the crazy thing about it is that they actually believe this because they've actually been given plenty. So Allah gives them plenty, and then they think, well, I've got all this. The hour is not going to be established. And even if it was, I go back to Allah, I'm going to give him my good deeds, show him all the great stuff I did, tell him a thing or two, and then I'm going to go into the paradise. And you'll often hear this from some slaves of Allah, especially from your more irreverent atheists who will say, well, they're asked sometimes, well, what will you, how will you give an account for your life on the day of resurrection? They'll say, well, I'll go right up to my Lord and I will say, how dare you strike kids with cancer? How dare you do this? How dare you? As if there's going to somehow be time, right? As if there's somehow going to be an ability to this. So understand very carefully that these ayat are telling us that those people on the day of resurrection who believe this of themselves, that there's no escape for them. In the next ayat, Allah explains that they're not going to have any time on the day of resurrection to sort of be coming through and sort of trying to turn the tables on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No, I'm going to ask him a thing or two. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind and let him know how I feel. Just as much as, just as much as the toast out of the toaster would pop out and tell you a thing or two about the butter that you've been putting on it. Right. This is a creation. So listen to what Allah the Exalted he says about his creation. He says, as the Imam continues further, quote, We shall surely inform those who rejected faith, meaning they shall be informed of the wickedness of their deeds. And what came after? And this has been explained already in Surah Ibrahim, the 14th Surah, Ayah 15, Ayah 17, and Surah Al-Isra, the 17th Surah, Ayah 83. They shall be informed of what they had done, and they have a great penalty and punishment waiting for them. And then, when it is given after this, so they possess or they give a supplication, calling out, 
a great deal because of the trial that they've fallen into when some good comes to them. So they make long calls to Allah. Why this? Why that? Say, O Muhammad, to the people of Mecca, don't you see that if the Qur'an is indeed from Allah and you've denied it, who is more astray than the one who's opposing the truth after that? So it means there's no one more astray than you if you've denied the Qur'an, if it's come from him to you. Ibn Jarir has said, so you've denied it. It's, it's as if he's saying to them, you've denied it and you're rejecting the truth when you've got a clear example of the truth and you choose to be far from that which is correct. And then he, Allah, he says, we shall, cert we shall certainly show them our signs on the horizons and in themselves. There are five things that this ayah is referring to when it mentions the horizons in themselves. The number one, number one, is that the horizons refers to the conquest of the far regions of the earth, of the land. The conquest of the far regions of the land, in the earth. Themselves refers to the conquest of Mecca. This was said by Al-Hasan al-Basri. Mujahid and As-Sudayy. Number two is the horizons means what Allah has brought about what Allah has brought about with previous nations in themselves means the day of the battle of Badr. This was mentioned by Qatada and Muqatil. The third is that the horizons refers to the produce being withheld from the land. in themselves are diseases that shall start to come to pass in their bodies. This was given by Ibn Juraj.
Number four is the horizons referred to signs in the sky. Connected to the sun, the moon, and the stars. in themselves refers to events that are going to take place in the earth. This was said by Ibn Zaid. Ibn Zayd, as a side remark, also said, Isn't it a wonder that the human being eats and drinks from one place, and yet the waste products of what he eats and drinks that go in that one place come out as feces and urine from two different places? Isn't that a wonder indeed? The fifth explanation of these is the horizons refers to monuments left over from before their time Monuments left over from before their time of those who rejected faith. The in themselves for the fifth point is referring to the fact that they were created as a sperm drop then a clot they were created as a sperm drop then a clot then flesh and bones up until the point they were given intellect and the ability to distinguish Thus, when Allah says, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth, it is the truth, meaning the Quran, but also more generally, all of what the Messenger وسلم, called to. Ibn Jarir al Tabari, Rahimullah, he said, the meaning of the ayah is when Allah says, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth, meaning until they know the true reality of what was sent down upon Muhammad and what we revealed to him from the promise that his religion shall be manifest and dominant over all other religions. 
Is it not sufficient for your Lord that he is a witness over everything? Meaning, is it not sufficient that he is witness over everything? And as the judge has said, it means that is, is his witness not enough for you? Is it not clear to you that he's revealed this? And if he's given this revelation that's true, is it not then clear enough a sign to you of his being one and unique and that he's established his messengers on the truth? That indeed should be enough. The exalted one then brings us to Surah Hamim Ain Sin Qaf. It's also known as Surah Shura. It is a Meccan Surah. This has been explained by Ibn Abbas, Al Hassan Al Basri, Ikrima Ibn Abi Jahal, Mujahid, Qatada, and the vast majority. Although being a Meccan surah, it has ayat within it that are from Al Medina. This includes ayat such as Qul la as'alukum alihi ajara. Say, I do not ask you for any wage. Ayah 23. Then there is also Ayah 24. Then we have the statement of Allah, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْبَغِي Those who when there comes to them some trouble. Ayah 39. And also, Ayah 41. The Exalted One, he starts this surah with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Hamim. I. كَذَلِكَ يُوحِي إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبَلِكَ اللَّهُ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ لَهُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ تَكَادُ السَّمَاوَاتُ يَتَفَطِّرُ طرن من فوقهم والملائكة يسبحون بحمد ربهم ويستغفرون لمن في الأرض ولمن في الأرض ألا إن الله هو الغفور الرحيم والذين اتخذوا من دونه أولياء الله حفيظ عليهم حفيظ عليهم وما أنت عليهم بوكيل 
وكذلك أوحينا إليك قرآنا عربيا لتنذر أم القرى ومن حولها ومن حولها وتنذر يوم الجمع لا ريب فيه فديق في الجنة وفديق في السعير ولو شاء الله لجعلهم أمة واحدة ولكن يدخل من يشاء في رحمته والظالمون ما لهم من ولي ولا نصير أم اتخذوا من دونه أولياء فالله هو الولي وهو يحيي الموتى وهو على كل شيء قدير وما اختلفتم فيه من شيء فحكمه إلى الله ذلكم الله ربي عليه توكلت وإليه أنيب حاميم عين سين قاف Likewise it's been revealed to you and to those from before you by Allah the Almighty the All Wise He possesses what's in the skies and what's in the earth He is the All High the All Grand The skies are close to being rent asunder and split from above them and the angels glorifying with praise their Lord seeking the forgiveness for those that are in the earth the weight of this indeed is it not then that Allah is the forgiving the compassionate those who take from besides him protectors Allah is preserver over them and you have you have no trustee you have no trust over them to protect them likewise we reveal to you a Quran in Arabic so that you might warn the mother of all cities and whoever is around her and so that you warn of a day of gathering in which there is no doubt in There shall be one group in the paradise and one group in the fire. If Allah had willed, he could have made them all one ummah. But he enters whoever he wills into his mercy. And the oppressors, they have neither protector nor guardian. Or have they taken from besides him protectors? When Allah is the protector, he gives life to the dead and he has power over everything. And whatever thing you may differ in, then its judgment goes back to Allah. That is Allah, my Lord. And upon him I put my trust. And to him do I put my faith. Surah Al-Shura, the 42nd Surah, Ayat 1 to 10. Now when the Exalted One has said, Hamim, we've already discussed this in Surah Al-Mu'min previously, so someone can refer to that. As for Ain Sin Qaf, then it's been said that this is an oath that Allah is making because Ain Sin Qaf are abbreviations for names of His. As said by Ibn Abbas, it's been said that these, these letters represent names of His, such as Ain being the knowledge of Allah, and Sin being His grandeur, and Qaf being his might. This was mentioned by Ibn Abbas as well as Al-Hasan al-Basri in one narration. It has also been said that the Ayn and the Ayn in the expression refers to the punishment of Allah, Ya'adab, 
that the scene refers to the transformation of those that reject faith, the mesh, and that the qaf refers to the false words said against those of truth, the qadhaf. This was also offered by Ibn Abbas. It has still been said by others that the Hamim refers to warfare, harb. That the meme refers to the changing of kings from their posts. The ayn referring to a dominated enemy or conquered enemy. And the scene referring to a famine coming like the famine of Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. The qaf referring to Allah's might over the kings of the earth. This was said by Ata al Khurasani. Others, such as Sa'id ibn Jubayr, have said that the ayn refers to Allah being knower of everything. The seen meaning, so the ayn being his, the knower of everything, alim. The seen meaning he's, he's holy, quddus. The qaf meaning that he's dominant, qahir. Whereas as Suday and Qatada have said that Ain means he is mighty, Al Aziz, Seen meaning he's the possessor of salvation, as Salam, Qaf meaning he is able, Al Qadir, as said by As Suday, whereas Qatada has said these are names of the Quran. Likewise, we've revealed to likewise it's been revealed to you. Meaning, just as prophets before had ha mim ayn seen qaf, this was given to every prophet. And we're revealing it to you, as mentioned by Ibn Abbas. However, others have said that what's being made reference to is, likewise, we've revealed to you information from the unseen, just as was revealed to you by other prophets, as said by Ibn Abbas. Some have said that, Hamim Ayn Sin Qaf was sent down regarding a pronouncement before punishment comes. So we reveal to you that the punishment is coming on whoever denies you, just as we revealed that to others before you. This was mentioned by Muqatim. Now, as for the meaning of the ayah, likewise we revealed to you, said by Ibn Ibn Jirir al Tabari. Now, the ayah, Kedalika. Yuhi. Whereas in one recitation, Ibn Kathir, Kedalika Yuha, it has been recited. Aban from Asim recited it as Nuhi. The skies are about to come, the skies are about to be rent asunder, torn. They're about to be torn, the skies over, overhead from the majesty of the glorification of the most merciful. Although one authority said on account of the idol worshippers saying the most merciful has taken a son. Part of this was discussed in Surah Maryam, the 19th Surah 90. However, the dominant reading is that it's referring to all the angels who are praying by the command of their Lord, and they are glorifying and extolling his virtues, seeking forgiveness for whoever is in the earth. And they intend by that the believers in the earth, as said by Qatar in the Sudai. Likewise, they're seeking forgiveness for the believers. So whereas when the trials and tribulations happen, they pray for them. For whoever is in the earth. They're asking that sustenance be sent down to them to protect them. Now, someone said that this ayah was abrogated by the ayah وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And they seek forgiveness for those who believe. Surah Ghafir, the 40th Surah 7. This is nothing. 
because the angels seek the forgiveness for the believers and not the unbelievers. So there's no need to try to make the pre this eye a general in order to then say it's abrogated by something else. This is baseless. Because the unbeliever doesn't deserve to be asked forgiveness for by the angels. Only the believers are forgiven. Close quote. Now understand this. This is a very important point. Um, it's mentioned here then that the weight of the majesty of Allah and the angels glorifying him. This shows that our creation, seven universes, is brimming with life. There's, there's creation everywhere. It's brimming with life. If you want to understand why when you speak with someone who's not a Muslim, they're arguing the way that they do, you have to go back and study the period coming outside of the period coming after the Renaissance and then you have the Enlightenment and then you have industrialization. In order to accurately understand this, we need to go back a little bit. In the United States, there was what's known as the Scopes Monkey Trial. Now, prior to the Scopes Monkey Trial, it was illegal in many schools in the United States to teach evolution in school because it was seen as unscientific. Keep in mind that at this same time during the Scopes Monkey Trial, most of your Egyptologists were doing their, uh, their journeys through Egypt, uh, the Upper and Lower Nile. Anthropology in the English world was formed because anthropology was based on trying to catalog the races from inferior to superior. And anthropology was said that this will find us the link between the white man who is the key, the pinnacle, the essence, and the races that are the build-up to that. So all other races were stepping stones. And so the white man, the lowest races were the darker, and then they gradually get lighter and lighter and lighter until finally the perfect race has been set upon, the white race. Before... In the United States and many schools, white people being superior was a given based either upon social construct, but sometimes Christianity was used along with it. At this time with anthropology, you then also had a split occurring between anthropology and geology. And people started to argue that the earth through Malthus and others was millions of years old. Now at this point, at that point, once these arguments started, anthropology, geology, all these were separate sciences. So you would have geologists that would say earth is millions of years old. Other geologists, it's not. It's 6,000 years old. It was created on the 22nd of October at 10 a.m., 4,004 B.C. And there'd be no issue between those two parties because it was there was no problem because evolution was not a scientific theory. And generally, if you were not an evolutionist, you held what's called the fundamentalist belief that the Earth was roughly 6,000 years old. Before the Scopes Monkey Trial, the different scientific disciplines in geology and anthropology started to come together loosely, like the laces of a shoe when you tie them. So it created what is known as scholastic homogeneity. 
They were all saying the same thing. Once they were all saying the same thing, they began to challenge why in many schools evolution couldn't be taught scientifically when, as far as they were concerned, anyone worth their any anyone worth their weight in gold was teaching evolution from the scientific level whether we're discussing geology whether we're discussing anthropology whether we're discussing archaeology and all these other subsciences this led to the scopes monkey trial in which one of the schools in the united states a teacher taught evolution against state law and was fired. This led to a challenge in court. And on account of the Scopes Monkey trial, evolution being illegal to teach in many American schools was overturned. And now it's illegal to teach that a law created everything. The response to this change of this turn of events by Christian fundamentalists has been to try to gain ground through two main movements. One has been rigid fundamentalism in which they've tried to answer this. Rigid fundamentalism comes in, comes in through people such as uh, scholars like Dr. Walter Martin and his Christian Science Institute, which is which was later headed by Hank Hanegraaff and originally was being helped by uh, Gretchen Passantino. You had a number of other ministries that sprang up. John Ankerberg attempted to challenge this. But what John Ankerberg and Walter Martin and others decided to do was to accept the model that the earth was 4.6 billion years old, that the universe was 15 billion years old, to accept that model, but to insist on a biblical structure. The original position of the earth being 6,000 years old was retained by a small body of Christians. But they began to be ran underground. So they formed a body of people and the movement gained a lot of ground in the 1970s and the 80s. Eventually, this movement came to be known as the Intelligent Design Movement. And I'm sad to say that some Muslims thinking themselves intelligent have jumped aboard and used the same arguments now and they've been creamed in debates again and again and again. One example is a debate between Dr. Krauss and a Muslim intelligent design arguer in which over two hours, Dr. Krauss, who's one of the most senior figures in evolution, used math to utterly devastate this individual. Besides intelligent design being a dead end theory, we'll move from there, we won't touch that. But Intelligent design spent so much time dealing with trying to reinsert itself back into the U.S. school system and deal with everything else. It didn't deal with a lot of other areas. So initially, a lot of in the 60s and 70s, a lot of your intelligent design uh, proponents and advocates stated that the only life in the creation is on Earth. The universe is devoid of life. This is the only planet where there's life. Now you can obviously imagine the trial this would cause because people would say, well, how do we know this is the only... Because it mentions in the beginning of the Bible the creation of Earth and everything else, so that must mean that Earth's the only planet because they hadn't dealt with astronomy and they hadn't dealt with anything else. They hadn't even... I mean, if you study Christianity to any detail, there's almost no angelology whatsoever. There's almost no discussion on the angels, their number, their types. There's almost no discussion on angelology, nothing. So for them, man being on earth, that's it. 
There were even arguments against the space program. There's nothing out there. What are you going out there for? There's nothing. For the Muslim, now I'm going to bring this now full circle. For the Muslim, when you get into discussions with people that are now living in a post-modernist, post-modern society, they come to you with arguments that evolutionists have devised from the Enlightenment into the secular era. So they're saying, so how do they start an argument with you? They say, well, I just don't know how you can believe that there's no life anywhere else but here. We don't know. We haven't even seen the rest of the universe. So their mind is already turned on towards a Christian discussion. You have to immediately arrest that. You have to immediately arrest that false thought in their mind by when they start a conversation say well I'm an atheist you have to immediately start off by saying well listen the seven universes you started off like this you're really going to get a response seven universes because some people even haven't even heard of the multiverse position yet well I mean the seven universes are teeming with life what? how do you know that? well look at what Allah says here that the skies, in these universes, are about to kadu. They're about to burst. They're about to rent asunder from over them. With the angels glorifying their Lord with the names of holiness, they're glorifying Allah. They're about to burst asunder. That means it's full. If someone says, listen, if you keep pouring orange juice into this burlap sack, it's going to burst asunder. That means it's overwhelmed. It's gushing. It's, it's, it's absolutely fill, full to the point where if you do any more, it's, it's going to burst. If you keep blowing air into this balloon, it's going to burst asunder. It means it can't take anymore. The capacity is too much. It's full. The angels, wherever they are, full. Right? That is the attitude we have to have. Because the atheists especially those who are die hard on evolution are thinking back to the scopes monkey trial and they're also looking at their main detractors being the discovery institute in seattle washington do not allow yourself to be pigeonholed because if you do you'll never get out of that hole they won't let you so once you start taking the position, because when you start using arguments like intelligent design, then the immediate click is, how can you possibly believe the world is only 6,000 years old? What? But they've been conditioned to understand intelligent design, Discovery Institute, creationists, world is 6,000 years old. That's what they've been taught. Flood happened 4,400 years ago. Even though you go to the oldest pyramid in Abydos and the cartouches that list the, list the pharaohs and the 28 dynasties of the kings and pharaohs, there's 28 dynasties uninterrupted that go past 4,400 years. They go 6,000 years. So what was the response of intelligent design people to that? To compress the Egyptian dynasties, to compress the Sumerian dynasties and bring them forward. So, time is the enemy to all false religion and all cults. I say this just to make you understand. Do not allow yourself to get pulled into an argument like that. Now, the Imam Rahimullah, he carries on from this point. And he says, quote, And so when the Exalted One says, Those who take from besides him protectors, meaning the unbelievers of Mecca that have taken gods and they worship them from besides Allah. Allah is the real preserver over them, meaning that he preserves their deeds in order for them to be rewarded with the penalty on account of them and you are not and you are not to be the trustee over them meaning 
you cannot stop them for what they're going to be taken account for, for the reason that they are there to be taken account for. You cannot stop this process. This ayah, according to the vast majority, has been abrogated by Surah At-Tawbah, the ninth Surah 5. Although the narration coming, saying that it's the vast majority, is not an authentic narration. Now, likewise, when the Exalted One says, likewise, we reveal to you a Qur'an, an Arabic Qur'an. So, likewise, meaning what we mentioned before is we revealed to you an Arabic Qur'an in order to understand what's in it, so that you might warn Umm al-Qura, the mother of all cities, meaning Egypt, meaning, meaning Mecca, meaning Mecca, and the intent of the mother of all cities means Mecca and its inhabitants and what's around it. And that you might warn of a day of gathering, meaning you might warn them of a day of gathering. The day of gathering, the Yom al-Jama'ah, is the day of resurrection in which Allah shall gather the small and great, those from the beginning and the end, the people of the skies and the earth. There shall be no doubt therein, meaning there's no doubt in this day that's coming, that it shall be. And after this day, the, the people shall be gathered into two groups. One group in the paradise, one group in the fire. Then he mentions the reason for their being divided. Had Allah willed, he could have made them all one ummah, meaning upon one religion. Just like when he said, La jama'ahum ala al-huda. Then he would have gathered them upon guidance. Surah An'am, the sixth surah, 35. But he enters who he wills into his mercy, meaning into his deen, his religion. And the oppressors, the unbelievers, they have no protector to deflect from them the punishment, nor any helper to forbid them from that punishment. Or have they taken from besides him, meaning... Have the unbelievers taken from besides Allah protectors, gods that they can turn to when Allah is the only protector of his friends? They should take him as a protector besides the false gods. Ibn Abbas عنه, has said that this ayah is saying where Allah is saying, your protector, O Muhammad, is me and the protector of whoever follows you. And then when the exalted one says, and whatever you differ in at all, from the affairs of the deen, and as general, then its judgment is to Allah, meaning the knowledge is in the sight of Allah what it is, and its judgment can be found therein. Muqatil said, that is that the people of Mecca rejected, some of them rejected the Quran. Some rejected parts of it, and then believed in parts of it. So Allah the Exalted showed that he is the one as if he is saying, I am the one who makes judgments therein. That is Allah, the one who judges between those who dispute. My Lord, upon him I put my trust, meaning all of my needs. And to him shall I be guided, meaning all the slaves shall return to him. And on the day of resurrection, they shall be judged. Now the exalted one then says after this, فَاطِرُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ جَعَلَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا وَمِنَ الْأَنْعَامِ أَزْوَاجًا يَذْرَأُكُمْ فِيهِ لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ لَهُ مَقَالِيدُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَبَسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقَدِرُ إِنَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمٌ شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى 
أن أقيم الدين ولا تتفرق فيه كبر على المشركين ما تدعوهم إليه الله يجتبي إليه من يشاء ويهدي إليه من ينيب وما تفرقوا إلا من بعد ما جاءهم العلم بغيا بينهم ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك إلى أجل مسمى مسمى لقضي بينهم وإن الذين أورثوا الكتاب من بعدهم لفي شك منه مريب فذلك فدعوا واستقم كما أمرت ولا تتبع أهواءهم وقل آمنت بما أنزل الله من كتاب وأمرت لأعدل بينكم الله ربنا وربكم لنا أعمالنا ولكم أعمالكم لا حجة بيننا وبينكم الله يجمع بيننا وإليه المصير The opener and originator of the skies and the earth He made for you from yourselves spouses and from the cattle spouses he brought you about he brought you about therefore in he brought you about to be as this there is no thing like him and he is the all hearing the all seeing he has the control and dominion of the skies and the earth he spreads out the sustenance to whosoever he wills and he orders it according to its limits he knows everything he has mandated for you the true deen, religion. The same as, as that which has been advised and given to Nuh and that which we had revealed to you and what we have similarly vouchsafed with to Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa. And that advice is that you are to establish the religion and do not divide therein. Great indeed and grave is that which you call the idol worshippers to come to. Allah chooses to him whoever he wills and he guides to himself whoever he so chooses in that regard. They did not divide except after the knowledge came to them in which they wronged themselves. Had it not been for a word that your Lord had mandated until an appointed time, the judgment would have been made between them. Indeed, those who inherited, who were made to inherit the book after them were in doubt of it greatly. Now, because of that, then call out, then call out with clear voice and be upright, just as you've been commanded. Do not follow their desires and say, I believe in that which Allah had sent down of the book. I've been commanded to be just among you and judge with justice. Allah is my Lord and your Lord. We have our deeds and you have your deeds. There is no proof between us and between you when Allah shall gather all of us and judge between us. To him shall be the return. Surah Shura, the 42nd Surah, Ayat 11 to 15. And when the Exalted One has said in this regard, the originator and opener of the skies and the earth. We have already discussed the meaning of this in Surah An'am, the 6th Surah, Ayah 14. But, but as for the Ayah, he made for you from yourselves spouses. Meaning from your creation, you were given spouses. Spouses means women. And from the cattle, spouses. This means that of all the cattle, 
they were given male and female to be spouses to one another. The meaning is that he created for you the male and the female from the living things. So he created you, brought you to be therein, gave you life, as said by Sudaim Muqatin. And he made you many in number to be therein. Meaning that you might propagate and reproduce one another, as said by the vast majority. So you were brought about so that you might be plentiful in number and reproduce that you're carried therein. So this is referring to all living, all living creatures that are carried in the bellies of their mother. This was mentioned by Zayd ibn Aslam. So he created you in the bellies of women. And this is what's been explained by Ibn Qutaybah. So he created you in the womb or on account of coming together of the married couple or the spouse. Ibn Jirir said he, he created you and he made for you from your spouses and he caused you to come to life. He made the same thing for you from the cattle that you use. The same ruling holds for the plants of the earth, although differently. So he created from the skies and the earth and created all the plant life in its different forms, male and female alike. He's made some male, some female. Caused them to come to life. He did the same thing for the cattle, said by Muqatil. So everything has pairs, spouses that complement one another, as said by al Wahidi. And he made you great in number. Now then the exalted one says, There is no thing like him. Ibn Qutaybah said that means nothing resembles him. So there is no likeness for him. As the judge has said, that that the fact that it said Laysa Kemithlihi, there is no thing. The calf in Kemithlihi is to emphasize, to show that there is definitely no thing like him. Now we've already explained the all hearing, the all seeing in Surah Zumar, the 39th Surah 63, Surah Ra'ad, the 13th Surah 26. And then when the Exalted One says it's been mandated for you, meaning clarified, made clear the religion in the same way as it's been mandated and clarified for Nuh. Meaning, the halal has been made halal. The haram, haram. As said by Qatada. This ayah also refers to the forbidden marriages that are to occur. So, it is not permitted, who it's not permitted to marry whether it be sisters or brothers or close relatives, because this is mandated in all laws. It's been mandated for you the religion, meaning tawheed and abandoning idolatry. And the reason why I mentioned Nuh is because he was the first one to have to give such a mandate. And that which we revealed to you, meaning of the Quran, the laws of Islam, that which was revealed to you has been mandated to those before you such as Ibrahim and Musa and Isa, that you establish the deen. And that establishment is to enjoin with that, that which Ibrahim, Musa, and Isa enjoined with. The same thing of that it, the same thing as what Nuh enjoined with. So what we reveal to you. And what's been enjoined with those before. So it's been mandated for you and to those before you to establish the deen and leave and leave the cults. It's been mandated that you gather upon following the messengers. And that you establish that deen and establishing the deen. Deen is to establish the tawheed, the oneness and uniqueness of Allah. And do not break up into sects. Grave indeed is that what you're calling the idol worshippers to. Meaning the tawheed that you're calling the idol worshippers to is grave for them and difficult indeed. Allah brings to him and chooses from his slaves for his deen, whoever he wills, and he guides. 
whoever he so wills. So meaning those who are able to obey him. Then he mentions their breaking into different groups after he advised them to leave breaking into groups. And no one broke into the groups, meaning the people of the book, except after there came to them the knowledge. So after their knowledge came, they fell into wrong actions. After they knew that breaking into groups was a strainous. After the Quran came to them, they broke up into more groups. Because they did wrongdoing among themselves on account of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And had it not been that had the word would have certainly been fulfilled and the judgment would have come had it not been that it was mandated for a certain time. So those who denied from this nation up until the day of resurrection, they would have all been punished at once had Allah not decreed that there was a specific time. Those who are made to inherit the book, meaning Jews and Christians from after them, meaning after their prophets, are still in doubt about him, meaning Muhammad. Close quote. Now, something important here to understand. If you look at the time immediately before the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his time, you find that the churches, although they were far flung, still had some unifying points. Once he comes and they start to dispute and differ over him, the divisions start. So before he died, the seven rites of the Catholic Church had now formed. The other sects within Judaism start to spread out and branch out. All this stuff starts. Right? It's not just the fact that the sectarianism among themselves, but this ayah shows that it's a judgment from Allah. That they did not divide until the knowledge came to them. Part of that knowledge is referring to the knowledge of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When that judgment came, then they really started dividing among themselves. So that's partly a judgment from Allah against those cults and sects. Because the sects and the cults they follow, when knowledge comes to them, they break up based on that knowledge. And that applies to this ummah as well. Because all the cults that have broken off, that's a judgment from Allah against them. Because it's not that the Sunnis broke off from a cult. If you look at the oldest references to Ahl Sunnah, you find Ibn Abbas, Muhammad ibn Sidin, these are students of the Companions. If you speak to the Shia, they will tell you that they left. Yes, we broke off. Every single cult of the 72, they started out as Sunnis, then they broke away. So our response should be that, well, you left. Surely something must have been wrong with you to have left. And how could we be on the wrong when we've only been doing what we've been doing? which is staying in this wide, far-ranging jama'ah. We've been told to stay. Alaykum bis sawad al-a'adham. You must stay with the vast majority. That's what we're doing. That's all we're doing. So when you've broken off and formed another group and then named your group, well, that's a judgment from Allah against you. Because every single one of these groups, if they don't go back to a prophet or that early community, they're already judged by Allah. We don't have to curse them. They're already judged by Allah. You look at Salafi, okay, where does this expression come from? We can trace it back to 1905. Okay, so it goes back to Muhammad Abdul. We can trace these things. The Ahmadiyya, we can trace it. Baha'is, we can trace them. Every single cult has been named after its founder or it's had some title that it's put on itself. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah goes back all the way back to the companions and their prophets. That's the whole point. We're not worried about what you have to say that might sound pretty. We want to know where you came from. And we can apply this to Christians. Someone comes to give you the good news about Jesus at your doorstep, say, excuse me, do you go to the Lutheran church up there? Yes, so that means you're Lutherans. That means you go back to the 1460s. I'm not interested. Because you only go as far as Luther. 
That's the 1460s. You know what was going on in the 1460s? Imam Bahuti's grandfather was that was Sheikh Al Azhar. You know what was going on in the fourteen in the fourteen sixties? Zakaria Al Ansari and all these big ulama were writing major books on fiqh. You weren't even a fleck. You weren't even on our. You weren't even on the radar of the Muslims in the fourteen sixties. Then you go to the Anabaptists, the Baptists, and then the Lutherans split, so they become peace, peace Lutherans and the others. Then you have the Pentecostals, Oneness Pentecostals. Who founded all this stuff? Seven Day Adventists. Then you have it start to get really crazy because now you have the 1830s. So you have Joseph Smith and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints where he believed that Nabi Isa Islam appeared to the Native Americans. And then just, and there's golden plates buried in Ithaca, New York and upstate New York. And he uncovered them and they were a previous nation and that the, the Native Americans were ancient Israelites. 1830. Listen. If we can trace your organization and it doesn't go back to a prophet and that first congregation, we're not worried. If we can't find you in the first three generations, we're not worried. People say things all the time, say, oh, okay, can you give me an example of your entire creed in the first three generations? I can just follow that. Just follow the, follow the trail. Well, you're not going to find anything. Of course I'm not. And it goes back to the statement of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, and a chain is quoted. Some people dispute the chain, but other authorities say it is a valid chain, like Ibn Sa'ad, where he saw a group of Shia. This is before they began to break into Twelvers and others. And he was coming out of one of the local masjids in Al-Kufa. And he was holding... He was holding his he was holding his uh, sandals in his hand and walking around them. And they thought, why would you do that? Because you have to remember the earlier masjids had sand floors, no carpeting. So people played and prayed in their sandals, prayed in their shoes, prayed in their boots. And they said to him, Why are you carrying your sandals around us and walking around us? He says, Well, from the time of the Prophet, وسلم, the Shia in his time used to steal the slippers and the uh, sandals of the believers in the masjid. And the Shia, they said, you're a liar, Abu Hanifa. There were no Shia in the time of the Prophet. He said, that's right, because you're an innovation. And every innovation is an astrayness. And then he left. So anytime we can't trace something to that first community, we don't care. We don't care. Now, to end this page, Imam Ibn Jazeera, rahimahullah, I'm finishing off this page, he says, quote, And when the exalted one has said, and because of that, then fad'u, so call, meaning call out to the people, call out to the Qur'an, and call out to Tawheed, as said by Ibn Asa'i ibn Muqatil, be upright and do not follow their desires, meaning the people of the book that he's calling because they might call him to their religion. Tell them instead, I've been commanded to be just and to judge between you with justice. So to judge between them in justice and all the judgments that I've received and in propagating the message I've been given. Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So he is our God and your law and your God. He shall certainly reward us for our deeds and you shall certainly be brought to bear for your deeds. So we have our deeds, meaning it's reward. You shall have what you have. And there's no proof or judgment among us and between you. Meaning there shall be no dispute on that day because the judgment shall be clear. So this ayah shows that there shall be a judgment that they have been warned. And this is before any judgments were sent down regarding fighting in the path of Allah. So the proofs that were being brought against them were proofs established by revelation and miracles. And this was explained by our Shaykh Ali ibn Ubaidullah and other scholars of commentary. 
close quote. أقول قبل هذا أستغفر الله لي ولكم أستغفر الله إن الله غفور رحيم الحمد لله. الحمد لله. Today we have recovered or we've covered uh, four pages. Inshallah. Are there any questions over what we have covered so far today with regards to uh, commentary on these four pages? Commentary on these four pages. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. There's a verse that's uh, quite commonly uh, quoted amongst um, certain uh, voices uh, of certain sects. And the one that I'm meant, uh, speaking about is the one where it says uh, this religion, Islam, will be manifest and dominant over all of the religions. And the interpretation that they give is, and the sort of impression that they give is, in the West that we were going to take over and that we're the fastest growing religion and that we're going to convert everyone at one point uh, in time in the future. And could you sort of, um, and what they're trying to say is that so continuous progression towards something better could you sort of give the correct interpretation of this the question the question is regarding the statement that's made in surah the Tawbah, the ninth surah as well as in surah the saf where allah says that we have sent the messenger with the truth the guidance and the, and the true religion to be supreme over all the religion although the idol worshippers don't like it another statement says although the unbelievers may dislike it and allah will perfect his life and that this ayah is used to mean that that's referring to Islam in the West and that it shall grow and eventually uh, the people shall be converted to Islam. Uh, what should be our understanding of this? Because these ayats are being understood to mean this in this current modern age. What should we understand? Uh, alhamdulillah. Salatu uh, First of all, <clears throat> the response to that would be that that's a baseless understanding. Because the only time we've ever been given, the only time we've ever been given a clear statement on everyone being Muslim and Islam would not be accepted from anyone else, is the descent of Nabiuna Isa alayhi salam in the second advent, in which everyone shall believe. The idea that by starting these massive missions and making a thousand Muslim Billy Grahams, that that will then cause this mass conversion. Now, every one of these sects or groups or whatever they might call themselves has their own way of going about it. For the Salafis, it's by converting, first of all, Muslims to, quote, the true Tawheed and sometimes killing them through this idea of jihad. So we're going to make jihad against the whole world and then it will become Muslim. That's baseless because... The Ottomans were making jihad perpetually and neither were the Abbasids and the Umayyads. So that would mean that the first four Khulafa failed and all Khilafah systems after them failed. If we say that it's Dawah from now until the end, that's baseless because we've only been given narrations about Islam being dominant because in the Hadith and the Sahih of a Muslim in the, book of, at the end of the book of Iman, he actually explained that ayah to mean that when the Nabiuna Isa Islam descends, that shall be the only religion accepted. Right? That's what that ayah means. That's what those ayat mean. Because they're, there's those ayat are what are called mutashabihat, it means they, they appear more than once. And that ayah is only referring to the conversion of all believers at the time of Nabiuna Isa alayhi salam. So if someone thinks that you know, we have an individual obligation to get out there and, and force Allah the Exalted to bring on the Day of Resurrection and bring it now and to force his hand and create one million Muslim Billy Grahams or Franklin Grahams or all these different people. We've got to produce these people and that will therefore lead to a worldwide conversion. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because we've been told in those ayat that that's what it means. That's what it means. Just like, for example, there's some people who say we shouldn't tell people about uh, the great fire that's coming in the hereafter for those who reject faith because people don't believe in that nowadays. So we shouldn't tell them that. We should try to convince them with the intellectual, scientific proofs of the Quran. Well, 
I, I won't make a I won't make a judgment immediately. I'll just ask you to say, I wonder what type of converts those type of people make. I'll let you do your own homework. On that. I wonder what type I wonder what type of Muslims those people are. All right. All right. Any further questions? No. So we will stop here, inshallah. And when we next come together, we are moving from ayat sixteen onward from Surah Shura. And so we say, Subhanakallahumu bahamdika, wa shahadu wa la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa yatubu ilayk, innahu ghafur rahim al-hamim rahimin, wa la ilaha illa Allah, wa salamu alaykum.